she ain't getting tired because she's just dropping these people. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, what are you guys like getting mad with you win this thing or something? And all of a sudden they look back like, oh, you weren't kidding. I'm like, no, you're, you're dropping them.
of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Howdy, how you doing? Yeah. Oh, we could do better than that. We're, this is a celebration. It's been 50 years and we have a long way to go, but that's all right. It has been 50 years of some progress, nevertheless. My name is Terry Thomas, a local Tucsonian, born and raised here, right over there at St. Mary's Hospital, back in 1958. It is an honor to be here supporting Pastor McDowell and all the committee members, Clarence Borkins with the Tucson Southern Arizona Black Chamber of Commerce, all the committees and those who helped to make this a wonderful event, outstanding event. To all of you who just took the time to just come out and uh, give up your evening and be a part of this uh, event here. This Tucson commemoration of the 1963 March on Washington. Let's give it a little bit of hand for that, okay? Just a little bit. Now, once again, I said my name is Terry Thomas, but some people call me the text master. Because I will let you know via text. Now, today we go, we're going to have several speakers who are going to come up and give you encouragement, information, possibly. They're gonna to talk to you from their heart. But uh, for those who do come up, if you're in the audience, I want you to remember this. Keep uh, all of your speeches from th uh, three to five minutes because you know, those wonderful words that you give, that encouragement, that hope, starts to fizzle if it gets too long. That was a joke, you know? All right. Well, it's my honor to uh, uh, open right here and I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, probably first five or six um, People who are going to come up and talk to you, I'm not going to come back and forth between each one. Uh, we're going to move ahead so we can make it through this evening in a timely manner. Uh, we'll have an uh, invocation by Minister Maisha Tate. We'll have opening remarks. Uh, we'll have a word from Bishop Gerald Kianis of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Tucson. We'll have opening remarks from Pastor Elwig McDowell, Trinity Baptist Church. We have remarks from Jonathan Rothschild, our mayor of this beautiful, fine city of which I was born. We have remarks from H.T. Sanchez, Superintendent to USD, Tucson Unified School District. Also, we have a tribute to women from Donna Liggins, president of the Tucson NAACP. From that point on, I will give you, uh, from over there, I'll be announcing all the other speakers that will come before you. But right now, if you're not standing on your feet, if you would, I'm gonna have Vanessa Johnson, good friend of mine, proud member of the Tucson Slide Society, to come forth as she brings the national anthem to you. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony Of liberty Let our rejoicings rise Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the hope that the dark past has brought us. Sing a song full of the faith that the present has taught us facing the rising sun of a new day begun 
Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. And now we'll have the invocation from Minister Maisha Tate. Bow your heads. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember and commemorate the March on Washington in 1963. God, we thank you for bringing us thus far. Father God, we thank you that the dream of one man has continued this day, Father God. God, we ask that you would empower us to move forward, Father. Give us vision. Give us the, the wisdom to know how to move and when to move, Father. We thank you for bringing us to this moment, God, and we pray, God, that your spirit would rest here in this place with us today. God, we thank you once again. We bless you in Jesus' In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Once again, uh, in order, if they could come forward too, we have uh, Bishop Gerald Canis. Canis, okay, from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Tucson. Thank you. Diocese. Good evening. You know, we're all so proud of our community in Tucson. Diverse, dedicated, committed. And it's good when we gather. We gather tonight because we want to remember a champion, a true servant, a man who wanted to make the world that is more in harmony with the world as God intends it to be. And his dream excited a nation and brought so many changes. And a reminder to us that we must do our part to continue that dream because it is not yet fully realized. You know, the other day I was on the internet and I came upon this little piece from values.com which I think captures Dr. King's dream that he gave in on this day in 1963. It goes like this when I close my eyes I see the world that shall be a world where all walk hand in hand when the last child dies and cries for a piece of bread when the last man dies just for the words he said when there's shelter over the poorest head we shall be free yes we shall be free stand straight walk proud have a little faith and we shall be free and it ends with a little phrase, now you go, do your part. If Dr. King were here, he would wanna say, we have to now go and do our part so that we can create the world that the Lord intends, where every human being is treated with dignity and respect and has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice. I know our mayor has called us to be a city that is immigrant friendly. And not only that, but a city that is attentive. All right. And a city that is attentive to the needs of the littlest and weakest among us. None of us like to hear that we are the sixth poorest city in our country. And we have to do our part to help lift people up. That's what Dr. King was about, lifting people up. And now it's time for us to do our part. Firstly, a poem from Tupac Shakur 
Excuse me, but Lady Liberty needs glasses. And so does Mrs. Justice by her side. Both the broads are blind as bats, stumbling through the system, Justice bumped into Matulu and tripping on Ger Geronimo Pratt, but stepped right over Oliver and his crooked partner, Ronnie. Justice stubbed her big toe on Mandela, and Liberty was misquoted by the Indians. Slavery was a learning phase, forgotten without a verdict, while justice is on a rampage for endangered surviving black males. I mean, really, if anyone really valued life and cared about the masses, they take them both to pin optical and get two pairs of glasses. These are the words of Tupac Amaru Shakur, written when he was 18 years old, and I think that Lady Liberty and Mrs. Justice still need glasses, needed them in Sanford, Florida, in the George Zimmerman case, and in Oakland, California, in the case related to the murder of Oscar Grant. It is obvious that the stand your ground law in Florida and in Arizona needs to be changed so that justice and liberty will not need glasses. Fifty years ago today, 250,000 persons marched on Washington and gathered in the shadow of the Lincoln Memorial to declare their demands for jobs and freedom in these United States. Asa Philip Randolph, president and original organizer of the Pullman Car Porters Union, was the primary organizer and initiator of the march. He was helped principally by Bayard Rustin, and neither one of them is hardly remembered today. But that day transcends the recognition of any one or two or three persons. It was a culmination of the forces of history that began when the first Africans arrived on these shores in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. It was necessary because in 1660, Virginia was the first state to make all African slaves by law, with so many other states following their lead. By the time the founding fathers, many of whom were slaveholders, had constructed the Constitution, slavery was embedded in the fabric of this nation, so much so that African slaves were listed in that Constitution as three-fifths of a person. We're still living in the aftermath of slavery. The, ge the genocidal killing of Native Americans, the discriminatory oppression of Latino persons and other oppressed groups, in fact, we're still on the plantation. We working class people and the owners of the plantation, the 1% would take us back to before 1865 if we are not watchful. Prison industries pay slave wages to inmates while persons profit from these industries. Private prisons incarcerate inmates at, at an expense greater than state-run institutions and sell stock on Wall Street betting that more persons will and should be incarcerated. African Americans are still treated sometimes as three-fifths of a person by some policemen on the street. And by their lack of resources in court and in the correctional system, they are treated badly throughout the criminal justice system. And I say that we are tired and we must act. We must stop spending money with companies that support the American Legislative Exchange Council, better known as ALEC, who have fostered anti-affirmative action agendas in the courts and stand your ground laws and voting suppression laws in the legislators, legislatures of Arizona, Florida, and many other states. We will not go back. We say today to Lady Liberty and Mrs. Justice to take off your glasses. We're tired of being tired. And we shall stand against injustice, not just with word, but with our wallets. Not just with protest, but with our pocketbooks. So in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., let freedom ring from Mount Lemon. Let freedom ring from A Mountain and South Mountain in Phoenix. Let it ring from the mountains of Flagstaff and the Valley of the Sun in Maricopa County. And someday, we shall all fulfill the dream of the beloved community as children of God. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. All right.
And now, if he is here, we'd like to hear some remarks from our mayor of this city. Here we go. If you would, put your hands together for Jonathan Rothschild. He's here. Uh, first Dr. King, then the bishop, and then Tupac. I, I don't know if I can follow that. Uh, but no, I can't. But uh, in my office, I have a poster of Dr. King looking over the uh, Washington Monument in the, in the mall uh, on that day 50 years ago and with the words of his speech below it. And it took me by surprise, really, last week that this was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedoms. When, when hundreds of thousands of people marched filling the National Mall, and when a preacher set aside his carefully crafted speech and launched into words that woke the conscience of a nation, I have a dream. Today, on this anniversary, we remember the sacrifices of those who came before us, men and women of conscience and courage. We sometimes forget about those men and women and what they went through. We need to remember them. And for those, and for, those for those who did not live through those times, it's hard to understand the difference the civil rights movement made. We speak today of the threat of terrorism. 50 years ago, terrorism was not a threat, but a reality. In the form of the Ku Klux Klan, in the form of the White Citizens Council. Torture and death could come at any time, as it did to 14-year-old Emmett Till, mercilessly tortured to death on this same date August 28th, in 1955, allegedly for flirting with a white woman. This country has come a long way since then, but we have a long way to go. Yet there are those who even today would turn back the clock to those dark times, if not through violence, then through suppression. Today, we see efforts across the country to suppress voter turnout among those the march intended to liberate, people of color and the poor. The Supreme Court of the United States has taken away a key provision of the Voting Rights Act, a provision that made it much more difficult for voter suppression to take place. In Arizona, our legislature, following that lead, has made it a crime for volunteers to deliver ballots to the polls. This is outrageous, and it's offense against liberty itself. There are greater gains still to be made in the pursuit of justice and equality, and greater gains even more to be made in the fight for economic equality. We cannot let slip the hard-fought gains of the past, and we must always honor those who brought us those legal rights. But even in 2013, our voting rights are under attack. And let me tell you this, the economic gains that we are still fighting for every day are nothing but an illusion if we do not get the funding and the proper funding for education so that our people can be educated to get those jobs we need. So today, I, and I'm sure all of us, will ask you to rededicate yourselves to the struggle. We must vote, we must inform ourselves, we must let others know in every election. That is the f rights that Dr. King and everyone who marched that day fought for. And that is how we will honor our past. And that is how we will safeguard our present. And that is how we will create our future. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Now I get an opportunity to 
deliver a proclamation from the city of Tucson. Whereas in 1962, civil rights and labor leader A. Philip Randolph called for a march on Washington to bring national attention to this continued struggle for civil rights and economic justice for all Americans. And whereas the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, held August 28, 1963, was the largest civil rights demonstration ever. And whereas more than 200,000 Americans from across the United States, some of them, by the way, who are with us today in this park, came seeking the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whereas Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech, which summed up the struggle and hope for a better future. And that march, the success of it, the March on Washington, was the catalyst for the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, now, therefore, I, Jonathan Rothschild, Mayor of the City of Tucson, do hereby proclaim August 28, 2013, to be the 50th anniversary March on Washington Tucson Commemoration Day in this community and encourage all of our citizens to remember Dr. King and the march that changed the course of history. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we'd like to hear some remarks from H.T. Sanchez, Superintendent, Tucson Unified School District. I must admit that I am both honored and humbled to be able to speak on this day of all days before this group. We are here today, the legacy of Dr. King. We are here gathered today as that legacy. As you look to your left, as you look to your right, as you look to the people before you and behind you, and you see those who are in a position today to be able to speak, to be able to, uh, to, be able to educate our children, to be able to have this gathering, we are that legacy. Amen. Now, I want to tell a very, very short story. My grandfather, who is 89 years old, for the longest time as a young boy in Texas, I never understood why every white man he knew, he didn't ever refer to him by first name. It was always Mr., Mr. Wilson, Mr. Edmiston, Mr. Johnson, and I always wondered why he looked down when he would address them. I always wondered. And um, it wasn't until I had the opportunity to get to university study that it began to make sense to me. And so I went, home to my small town of 2,000 people and I asked my grandfather why he never made eye contact and why everybody was Mr. And he said that that was the way he was brought up. And I asked him, I said, well, things are better. Why don't you change? Why don't you refer to these, these men by their first names? And he said, you know, I'm where I am. But he felt that he was vindicated in that people who he had to call Mr. would have to call his grandson, Doctor. The reason I tell that short story is the lesson, the lesson he taught me in that exchange is that only through education are we liberated. Only through education do we find freedom. And coming to this state, coming to Arizona, a state that underfunds public education, Amen. I don't think that's accidental. I think there's some intentionality in underfunding the schools that are in our neighborhoods. Because if you can't teach the children how to think, then they can't question. And if they can't question, then they don't go out and vote their mind. So I'll end with this. I'll end with this. It's not about equal access to education, it's about equitable outcome. And that has to be our focus. And the way you reach to equitable outcome is you have to tell the truth, you have to tell history through not just one lens, not just one perspective, but all perspectives. Because the truth doesn't belong to one group, the truth belongs to us all. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have a little change in our program, if you will. At this time, we're going to ask for Honorable Raul Grajava, U.S. House of Representatives, to come to the podium and deliver some remarks for us, and then we will continue with our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this anniversary and this time in the history of this great nation of ours and our communities is not only significant, it's, it's transformative. 50 years ago, the struggle was and continues to be for those marginalized, for those discriminated against, for those made less than whole in this country, to have a place at the table of opportunity, but also to gain the dignity and respect to be treated with equity and justice in this great nation of ours, that the law applied to all. That march changed this country. I am standing here, and many of my colleagues of color are standing in a position similar to mine because of the Voting Rights Act. And we have to protect that and make sure that Congress assures that preclearance continues to be part and parcel of any decision making made at a state or at a local level. A reporter asked me, it's 50 years, isn't everything still the same? Aren't we still dealing with the same issues we were dealing with 50 years ago? Aren't we still talking about education and lack of opportunity? Aren't we still talking about quality jobs and the right of working people to be represented and respected in the workplace? Aren't we still talking about access Aren't we still talking about those issues that 50 years ago all of you guys talked about and all you women talked about? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. There's a difference. The difference that has happened to this nation is one of attitude. The difference that has happened in 50 years is that America is recognized in its full entirety that it cannot be a whole nation it cannot be a whole nation to survive as a country with a continued practice of denial, segregation, and treating people less than equal. That has been the gain in this country. It has been the gain in this country. So those battles continue for our gay brothers and sisters. That battle continues for working people. That battle continues. For the immigrant community, the battle is upon us. And for the children of this nation, that it's time when we need to invest in their future, we try to take away their future. That battle continues. But what we learned in 50 years, that this struggle is constant. We don't pause, we don't relax, because the more